Hey, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly online event. Um, we are a webinar. Uh, you can call us a webcast, an online show. If you have issues with that terminology webinar, I know many people do. Um, call us whatever you want. We are here live every Wednesday morning online at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record the show, and all of our recordings are posted onto our YouTube channel and um, the any presentations from people, any links that are uh, mentioned during shows. Uh, we gather all that and post them also onto our website. So I will uh, show you that at the end of this show so you can see where you can get to all of our recordings. Um, both our live show and our recordings are free and open to anyone to um, watch. So please do share with any of your colleagues out there, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we've had on the show. Send, this, send them over to our website and they can check them out there. Um, we do a mixture of things on the show, book reviews, mini training sessions, interviews, demos. Uh, basically, our uh, main only, only criteria, really, is if it is library related, um, you, um, we are happy to have the topic on the show. Um, we do do um, sessions with Library Commission staff sometimes, but we also do bring in guest speakers, as we have done this morning. Um, on the line with us is Jason Puckett, who's um, from Georgia, Georgia State University. Hi, Jason. Hi, Krista. Hi. Thanks so much for the invitation. Hi, everybody. Hey, thanks. Um, we are very glad to have you here. Um, he is uh, the author of a new book, which has just been published, correct? It's out now? Yeah, it just came yeah. out in uh, November. Yeah, November. from ACRL. And don't mm -hmm. worry mentioning where you can find the book in the presentation. Uh, okay. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, book about modern pathfinders, which is what his, his talk is going to be out. So, um, you know, lots of people out there, um, more often in at universities, but I know so possibly also in public libraries, use these kind of online research guides, lib guides, and whatever you may have out there. Um, and Jason's going to tell us all about those and how you can really make good use of them, right? I, I hope so. Every, everything let's, and let's anything we out. need to know in just an hour. <laughs> no pressure. I'll do my best, Krista. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Take it away then. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, let me... Uh, tell you just a word or two about myself. That's me. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm a subject librarian for communication, for the communication department, and uh, newly the uh, computer science liaison librarian. I also, uh, one of my titles is virtual services librarian, which means basically I run our, uh, our libguides and our, uh, our libchat services, our virtual reference services as well. Um, I teach some workshops for Simmons College. If you're interested in, you know, hearing more about some of this stuff, uh, I will probably have some, some workshops coming up with Simmons this year. Simmons this year. I'm the author of a couple of books. The most recent one and uh, most relevant one is called Modern Pathfinders. Uh, these are both from ACRL. I'm also the author of a guide uh, about Zotero that's a few years old now, but I'm working on a second edition that's coming this year. So, um, Krista, I've got my uh, chat window minimized just to kind of uh, reduce the number of distractions that I have on my screen while I'm juggling slides and such. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if if you want if you want to pause for questions at any point, just attract my attention, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm happy to take a moment for questions. No what problem. I like... I'm happy to okay. interrupt. <laughs> Great. Terrific. Okay. Uh, what I would like to do, I was telling Krista that the last version of this talk I gave was an hour and a half. What I've tried to do is, is uh, kind of cut my slides down to the essentials this time, and uh, I will do my best to keep an eye on the time, and, and I would really love to leave uh, 10 minutes for questions at the end. So I'm going to do my best to do that. I know uh, we can run over a few minutes if we need to, but I don't want to keep people longer. So I'm going to do my best. So what we are going to be doing today, my intention. This is not a how to use LibGuide section. This is going to be um, more principles that anybody can use with any system that you may be using for guides. If you've got a homegrown system, if you're using wikis to build your research guides, uh, whatever system you're using, this will not be specific to LibGuides. Although I do use LibGuides and that will be probably where my examples are coming from. 
Uh, I'm coming at this from the point of view of an instruction librarian, a public service librarian. Uh, as I said, I'd love to have people chime in with questions as we go. My background is in is excuse me is entirely in the academic libraries, but as Krista said, I think that this is going to be useful to anybody who uses research guides in whatever form. Um, I don't think that this will be specific very much to academic libraries. I'm not coming at this from the point of view of a systems librarian or from a, a, a systems administrator. I'm really, what I'm going to be talking about today, I think is going to be useful for, for any instruction librarian or any librarian that, that makes uh, research guides for your users. So let's talk a little bit about terminology. When we say, I've sort of settled on research guide as my generic term, but I, these are called a lot of different things at a lot of different libraries. Um, research guides, pathfinders is a little bit of an old fashioned term. It's not so much in vogue anymore, but I kind of like it. I feel like it's an evocative term and I, I intentionally used it in the title of my book and my talk. Um, but you'll hear these things called web guides, subject guides, and libguides has become sort of a generic term, you know, like Xerox or Band-Aid. Uh, so I think, you know, if you say libguides, most people will know what you're talking about, even if you're not specifically using the libguide software. But what we're talking about, and this is kind of a, a definition that I've settled on here, it's it's a web page that, that addresses a specific information need. It's created by librarians. Other library staff create and edit these things as well. I'm using librarians broadly here. Um, but it's, it's any page on the library website that is designed to help users with a specific information need. These are often, uh, maybe typically, for a class, but not necessarily. Um, you know, the, one of the guides that gets the most use is my Zotero guide. That's not aimed at a specific class, but it is aimed at an audience that has a specific and defined information need. I come across this definition, um, a lot or variations of it, where we talk about research guides being a list of resources or a list of links. And I want to talk about uh, a lot today about how that is a little bit of a limiting idea, I think. Uh, we use these guides in a lot of different ways besides just providing lists of database links. Um, we use them as teaching tools and that can be as a substitute for a class or to supplement an in-person class. Uh, we use these as access points or our users certainly use them as access points to a lot of resources. They will find, frequently they'll find a research guide before they will find the main library homepage depending on what they're searching for. Um, as I say, they, they may be a substitute for a class. They are often a contact point with a librarian. I have students come to the reference desk from time to time and say, oh, you're Jason, I recognize you from your picture on your Zotero guide or your, your picture on one of your journalism guides or whatever. Um, it can be the, the place where people find my email address or people where people discover that we offer a particular service. So there are a lot more with, uh, there are a lot more than just a list of links or a list of resources. And so I'd like us to keep that idea in mind. It really can be a much more versatile uh, tool than just providing a list of links. So what I want to talk about today, this is sort of the big idea, and this is really, uh, this slide is sort of a summary of what I want to cover today. Um, this is a, really a preview of what we're going to talk about for the next half hour or 40 minutes. Um, guides are not just a list of links, as I said. Really one of the ideas that I'd like to promote is approach the creation of a guide in the same way that you would approach planning a class. Again, I'm coming at this from the point of view of an instruction librarian and there may be a lot of other contexts beside class planning, but that's one of the ideas that I really like to promote when you're, when you're putting together a guide. Think of it the same way that you would think of planning for a class. I really do believe that it's a teaching tool. I want to talk about some ideas about how uh, the user's perspective helps us in planning guides and how understanding the assignment or the task that the student needs to address can be really helpful to us in, uh, in our guides planning. Um, one thing that we do a lot is put too much information in our guides, and I'll talk about some ways, some concrete ways we can address that, uh, not overloading the user with too much information. And uh, we're going to talk about design, and let me let me explain a little bit about what I mean 
when I use the word design. In the course of doing the research for my book about guides and for my talks about guides that I've done recently, I've really kind of settled on a couple of design uh, ideas that I think are going to be useful to us in planning guides. And I, I mean design in a couple of different senses. One is instructional design. As you can tell already from my talk, teaching is a big part of my work and uh, instructional design has really informed a lot of my ideas about how to um, how to talk about research guides and how to think about research guides. Uh, if you don't have an instructional design background, don't worry. I'm going to talk about some very simple ideas that we can apply to, uh, to guide planning. And the same goes for an idea called user experience design, and you'll see this abbreviated frequently as UX. This is a principle from web design that a lot of librarians are not familiar with. I'm going to talk again about some very simple ideas from UX design and how they can help us in planning guides. You know, librarians are really not trained as web designers. Most of us are not anyway. And uh, it, it really behooves us a lot to, um, to think about the fact that we're working in a medium and what works well on a web page that may not work well elsewhere or vice versa. So I want to start with uh, with uh, some instructional design plans. And one of the, the most important principles to me that I use really fundamentally in my, uh, my teaching planning is a focus on learning objectives. All this means is have a clear idea in your mind when you're going into planning a class or a guide about what you want your students to be able to do after consulting the guide after taking class that they couldn't do before. Uh, I'm also, I'm using the word students. For me, typically my audience is students. If you're coming from a public library background, uh, that may be something very different for you. You can substitute the word users anytime I'm using the word students. What I'm talking about is just whoever's learning, learners might be a good word, whoever, uh, whoever is consulting your, your informational resources. For me, they are literally students most of the time. For you, they may be library users. You may have some other context. And faculty can be students in the sense. Faculty can certainly be learners in the library context. Okay. So how do you define learning objectives when you're planning a guide? Um, get rid of the idea of how to use the library. We often plan these things way too broadly. Instruction librarians who are listening, you will know you often get requests for just teach them in an hour how to use the library. And we laugh at that, and that's a ridiculous goal to try to hit. But frequently, we will have these very broad ideas when we're planning a guide that is are almost that broad or almost that broad. An effective learning objective should be, like I've got here in my bullet points, it should be something specific you want them to learn. It should be me measurable or observable in some way. You don't literally have to measure the result of this. Frequently we can't measure the results of a guide, but it should be something that you could observe, you could measure in some way uh, if, you, if you were you know, if you had these people in the room or if you gave a quiz afterwards. It should be something that could be measurable. I'll give you some examples in a second and that'll make some more sense. It should be something that's results oriented. That is, <clears throat> excuse me, your, your users should be able to do something afterward that they couldn't accomplish before. And typically it's going to be based on a need. Usually they're coming to your guide because they have an information need. Whether that is literally an assignment, as most of my uh, library users are coming to my guide because they have to accomplish a course assignment, or it may be maybe something a little broader, like they need to be able to accomplish a simple task, place an item on reserve, or place an interlibrary loan, or search by call number. It, it can be anything like that. Now, why is this important? Um, it's useful in a number of very practical ways. Uh, for instruction librarians, you can use your guide as a teaching aid, you can use your guide as an outline. Uh, if they are not coming to a class, it can substitute for a class in that sense. Um, this is something that helps users connect with the guide by finding what they need. And by finding, I mean they may be searching on the web to locate the information that they need and coming across your guide and being able to recognize your guide as 
a useful and relevant resource. It may be something where they're looking at the guide, they're skimming the page for what they need, and basing the guide on learning objectives can help them spot within the page what they need. That really does help uh, indicate to them, yes, this is a relevant information resource. And if you're working with a course instructor, as, as uh, academic librarians often are, it can really help demonstrate to the instructor okay, I have based this guide on your assignment. Take a look at how closely I have planned the guide based on the learning needs that I see that your students have. So a learning objective, in a nutshell, really is just define, if I'm teaching them something in class, what am I teaching them? If I had them in a class, hypothetically, you may not be doing classes for all of your guides, probably are not, but if this were a class instead of a guide, what would I be teaching them to do? So for example, these are some, uh, some learning objectives from my work, uh, just as examples. A good phrasing to start with is students or learners should be able to do this thing, whether it's uh, locating primary sources, distinguishing, uh, distinguishing between two different types of source. They need to be able to ultimately create a literature review. They need to be able to install Zotero. This is the level of specificity that I would recommend that you have in mind when you're working on planning objectives for a guide. I would recommend that this be something, and this is what I'm talking about when I say something that should be measurable in some sense. You may not be observing students locating historical newspapers, but you could, if you were sitting down with students, you could observe whether or not that they can do this. Now, if you use learning objectives that are based around words like they should understand, that's a much harder thing to observe or a much harder thing to measure. And that's what makes, in my mind, that's what makes a good learning objective. Something that they can do, something that they can accomplish that if you were in the room with them, you could observe whether or not they are able to accomplish this. So observe, uh, excuse me, avoid thinking in terms of they should understand this. This just helps you plan, and, and this is a very practical technique. This helps you plan what should I include on the guide, what kind of instructions should I have on the guide, what kind of resources that I should have on the guide. And as I said, I'm talking really a lot about uh, assignments, about specific learning outcomes, and there may not be a literal assignment, depending on what your, your teaching context is. But if you have an assignment specifically in hand uh, that you can tailor the guide, uh, so to speak, that can really help you a lot in planning the guide. I've got a couple of links here, and all, the URLs are here just for your later reference. And let me let me pop a couple of these up. I think you can see my uh, my web browser there, where I've got a research pro uh, guide by Laloria Canada. Yep, this is a, a no colleague problem. of mine. Terrific. Yep. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a great example, I think. And let me see if I can. Sorry, I've got too many windows open. Let me see if I can pull up my highlighter my spotlight. Okay. I don't know if it's showing or not. That's okay. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, what I've got here, I think you can see my mouse pointer. What I've got here is this is a great example because she's taken the assignment, broken down what students need to do. There's a welcome page. I'm not a big fan of welcome pages and I've tried to get rid of those on my guides, but she's got a good um, sort of step-by-step -step process here for the students on her welcome pages. There's a pretest, so she is clearly using this in a class environment. But what I really want to call out here is that she's got uh, some good labels here. Uh, what is a lit review? What are empirical articles? It really shows that she's broken down the, uh, the objectives that students need to be able to accomplish. They need to create a lit review. In order to do that, they need to be able to define empirical articles. Uh, they need to know what they are. That's getting close to an understand objective, but she's got some really good concrete stuff here, and I'm really a big fan of how do I find, if I were designing this guide, I might go with how do I find these, how do I cite them, and maybe think about condensing these. I'm a big fan of condensing information uh, on a guide that is now I've got, my browser is a little unresponsive here. I don't think I'm going to go with, 
Here we go. I don't think I'm going to take you through. There we go. That's working. I don't think I'm going to take you through all of these, but I do want to show you um, another example from what I've done. Not all of my guides are model examples, but I do want to show you sort of the principles that I'm talking about. So when I talk about uh, breaking down the assignment, uh, breaking down the uh, learning objectives by the assignment, I literally took this from the, the assignment that the students uh, were handed by the instructor. They have to write a journal entry uh, about teens as a constructed audience, and here's a couple of resources for that. Uh, they have to do another journal entry about press coverage of a particular topic. Here's some resources for that. I've given some very concise instructions here. I would probably cut this description way down. This is too much for a, uh, an undergrad, especially a first year undergrad class to work with. Again, too much information here, but I've broken it down by the steps of the assignment. I'm going to leave the other ones for now, but that's when I talk about constructing a guide based on uh, based on the steps of the assignment and tailoring it to the assignment. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Another thing, whoops, another thing that we love to do is put too much information on a guide because we're trying to put in everything that students might possibly need. Uh, the library already has a website. Hopefully students are already aware of the library's website where you can direct them to it for more information. But your guide is not the main library website. Your guide has a specific information need, and don't try to put everything on there. It leads to confused students because they can't find what they need, and it leads to a lot of extra work for the librarian because there's uh, there's much more content to update. Oh, Jason, before uh, sorry, before you go on, yep. um, someone does have a question yep. about one of your um, comments when you're on the the guides there. Sure. Um, why do you say that welcome pages are not a good idea? I think, uh, and I, I may address this later on in one of my slides, I think that it's possible to do a good welcome to my guide page, but I think the best guides will jump right into this is useful resources right there on the first page. Studies have shown that students are going to look at a guide for literally seconds before they decide whether they're going to use it or not. Mm -hmm. And I think it's better to have some resources right on the front page that say, these are useful databases for your topic. Here's how to search these databases. I think that's going to capture students' attention a lot better than a, a nice, friendly welcome message, even, mm -hmm. even a brief one that says, Here's what you'll find on this guide. Here's, uh, here's a, a paragraph about how to find the librarian. I think it, it has a lot more resonance and a lot more immediacy for the students if they see this is something that's specifically based on my assignment. I think mm -hmm. they're going to stick around a lot, more, a lot more for that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. They, they already know why they're going to this particular place. Yep. You don't need to say explain why they're there. I mean, if ideally, if this is an assignment or a certain topic they wanted to research, they already know that that's 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 the reason they're there. You don't need to tell them again. Right. And let me. Um, I, I'm going to hold that thought for just a second because I have some um, uh, some discussion in just a bit about uh, using language from the assignment and how that can help a, a guide. But I really think that if students mm -hmm. get on your guide and the first thing they see is oh, I recognize this terminology from the assignment that I'm holding in my hand from my, from my instructor, I think that's going to make a bigger impression on a student than a nice, friendly, welcome message would. Mm -hmm. uh, students, especially undergraduate students, are very practically focused. They're focused uh, very strongly on, is this going to meet my need? And if not, they're going to move on literally in less than a minute and not see the rest of your very carefully crafted guide. So that's, yeah, my, that's my instant, short answer. Instant gratification. <laughs> instant gratification. And some ways to use, some ways to do that are really, is really to use some of the terminology and the specific language from the assignment. And I've, I've got some, uh, I've got some examples from that that I'm going to show you in just a minute. Really good question though. And that's something that I harp on a lot in uh, some of the, the guide workshops that I, uh, that I teach for Simmons is I will 
tell people to just kill the welcome pages and go straight into a step one of the assignment mm -hmm. page instead. Yeah. Now, someone does have a question about us now about um, what you're talking about here about it's not the library site. I didn't know if you're going to mention this that they asked to keep mm -hmm. from duplicating information. Do you recommend sending users from the guide to the library page instead of replicating it? Is that what you're talking about? I would much rather library give somebody page. a link to the interlibrary loan page than a paragraph of instructions about interlibrary loan. Mm -hmm. One line that says you can borrow books from other libraries and make that a link to the interlibrary loan page rather than a full sidebar of instructions. That's usually the way to go in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm talking about on this uh, on this page here, um, uh, this slide, excuse me, uh, is we what we really want is a subset that's very carefully curated to meet the, the immediate information need on the guide specific to the task at hand. And as the subject specialist or not necessarily, you may not necessarily specifically be the subject specialist, but as the librarian who is tasked with meeting this information need, use your expertise and your judgment about what is going to be immediately relevant and what is going to be cut anything that, that would be nice to have and put links to anything that you think is really going to be useful and you really don't want to be lo you don't want to lose but keep it concise and keep it very carefully curated and selected well, let me just in the interest of time these are these are great unless you've got another question lined up let's let's keep moving though uh, nope go right ahead okay great so um, one thing that we, we are often called upon to make is uh, what I'm calling a subject guide here, and that's a more general guide, like for me, a journalism guide as opposed to a journalism 4800 uh, ethics guide, uh, a guide to the entire discipline. These are really tough to make well. Um, and a lot of uh, a lot of studies have found that that students, again, particularly undergraduate students, don't connect well with these. But they do find that guides that are focused on specific courses are a lot more useful. This is, among other things, this is because students are used to using learning management systems where there is a page that's based on their course. They're not used to thinking in terms of themselves as, say, a history student. They, they do think of themselves as a student that is enrolled in, um, you know, introduction to U.S. history course, but they don't necessarily connect that with the broader discipline of history or biology or whatever you're, whatever you're showing them. So it's a lot easier, I find, to make effective guides that are based on a course because, again, I'm a big fan of that um, learning need, that specific information need. If you are tasked with create, creating a subject guide that is a history guide or a biology guide or a guide that's supposed to address an entire discipline, it's a lot more challenging, challenging to do. My approach is still to think in terms of learning objectives. What is a common, what is a typical learning objective? What types of tasks are researchers in this, this discipline frequently trying to accomplish? And base your guide around that. It's fine to make that guide a little bit longer. Break it out into sub-pages so you can send people to a specific page of that guide. But that is, that is much more challenging. But I'm still an advocate of um, thinking in terms of, uh, uh, of learning objectives when you're basing the, the structure of that guide and the, the content of that guide. As you, you will not be surprised to hear, um, I really am a, a big proponent also of cutting down too much information off your guide, cutting down, uh, avoiding too much information as I've phrased it here. A good way to do, one way to do that is to do what they call chunking, which just means breaking down the content into pieces that are easy to learn and easy to digest, and in short, just not having too much uh, don't make your pages too long. That's all it means. Break your guide down into multiple pages and that is easier to digest, easier to um, take in and understand for your learners. Um, and it, when I say keep links to a minimum, we're often tempted to include every possible database that we think might be useful for this assignment. Uh, instead of including 10 database links on your guide page, 
include the two that you think are going to be definitely useful. Cut the other ones out, and if you really feel like you need to, you can always link to, here's a page with more help, but keep the immediate offerings short, concise, and definitely useful for the, for the assignment. So, in other words, uh, we want to reduce choices because too many options are going to overwhelm students, especially novice researcher. This is what I just said. Minimize distraction, minimize aggressions, uh, minimize clutter on your pages. Keep your pages short, and by that I mean vertically short, uh, and minimize extraneous information. Cut out anything that you don't think is really going to be critical. So this is a little bit more about um, addressing the information need, and uh, when I taught, when I started talking about cutting out the the welcome page, think like your students. Think what are your students going to be looking for when they come to your guide? What are they going to understand uh, as as useful information on a guide, and what are they going to sort of just skim over? One thing that we do often is organize our guides by format, and what I mean by that is a lot of guides are going to have a page for finding books, a page for finding articles, a page of web links to web, you know links to websites. That makes sense to us because as librarians, that's how we classify information. We treat information sources differently based on whether they are a serial or a monograph, based on whether they are a peer-reviewed journal or a popular source, based on whether it's a web link or an article. Students often don't care about that at all. Um, they are looking for where am I in this task and what do I need to accomplish. And again, that goes back to basing the guide structure on the assignment and on the task. What I really like to do is get a copy of the assignment, literally the assignment that's given to the students by the professor, and compare, okay, what are they? What steps are they going to need to go through? And I will look at my guide based on what I think, from my experience, that students are going to have to accomplish and see, if I were a student, could I locate where I needed to be in this guide based on this assignment? Another thing is to uh, really write for your audience and by that, I mean choose your terminology based on who you think your audience is. If your audience, as mine usually is, if your audience is college undergrads, really avoid librarian jargon. Um, avoid mentioning catalog records. Avoid mentioning, um, oh, anything that you think um, students are going to have trouble recognizing that's too jargony. If the professor uh, gives you an assignment for students where he is referring to you need to find academic journal articles, call them academic journal articles on your guide. That's what I mean by consistent terminology. Don't call them peer reviews because students may not have that mental connection yet. Keep your text conversational. It's fine to say, I recommend this for you. Uh, address them in the second person, refer to yourself in the first person. It can really help put a novice uh, researcher at ease. It's not always possible to do this, but it can be really helpful to get a colleague whose guides you like to take a look at your guides and say, hey, does this make sense to you the way I've laid this out? I, I can't possibly do that for every guide. My colleagues would kill me, but it's helpful to do once in a while. Hey, what would you do different from here? I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what I mean by concise text and scannable text in a minute, but, but again, keep your text brief. Keep the language clear so that if somebody's just skimming over the page, they can spot what they need. That's all I mean by that. Annotations. Link annotations. Database link annotations. Pay attention to those. If I'm linking to the database America History and Life on one of my guides, I am never in a million years going to just copy the link off my databases page, copy the, the description off my library's databases page, and paste it into my guide. There is going to be so much library jargon in there that would scare off an undergrad. Uh, I've got an example of this in a minute, but so much of our, our database, so many of our database links on our library websites are just paragraphs of marketing copy written by the vendor that mean nothing to students. 
write an annotation for your links, and by that I'm, I think everybody knows what I mean, just the text that accompanies that link. If I've got a link that says America, History, and Life, what I want to write to accompany that is just a sentence that explains here is how you use this for this assignment. Here is what you should be using this for. Use this in part one of your assignment where you have to find articles for your lit review. It may be helpful for you to use this advanced search setting. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. And do not just copy and paste the vendor render written marketing copy that says this database contains primary sources of blah 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 students aren't always going to recognize that just think about what are they going to need to know in order to use this resource that you're linking them to that's all there is to it librarians uh, don't really we, yeah we do have a couple yep. questions about that about the um, sure. information for your audience specifically for the students yeah, um, hit me Someone does have a question, which I think you just answered with your description right now about linking and, and the annotations that they were concerned yep. that linking, how did you feel about linking to discovery services? Is this too much information for undergraduates to sort through? Yeah, um, I, I do recommend our discovery service all the time to undergrads, and I do mention it, mention to them that you're going to have that problem too much stuff coming back and it's mm -hmm. hard to sort through. What I'll usually do if if I feel like, uh, what, what I'll usually do, I feel like on my guides it's a good place to link them to something that's more discipline specific that they might not find on their own. Mm -hmm. So I often, I often omit a link to our discovery service, but if I do link to it, I will usually say this is a good fallback position if you can't find anything. Remember you can be very specific when you're searching uh, and we just call ours discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's good discovery. to like point them. Don't don't just jump them into the whole ocean <laughs> to flail around. Yes. Send them directly to the specific um, database or section that it relates to whatever assignment they're trying to work on. That is my approach, and I think yeah. a lot of the time our students are just going to our discovery service and not getting into the databases if they're just out there on their own. So I mm -hmm. feel like the research guide's a good place for me to promote some more discipline-specific resources that they wouldn't find otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, so I tend to do that first, and then, but then if I feel like you know maybe I need to include this, I will mention specifically. If you can't find anything else, try this, but you may f you may get too much irrelevant mm -hmm. stuff back, so be very yeah. specific. Yeah, you can back out to a farther point, but be aware of what might happen. <laughs> Give them that yeah. warning, yeah. Uh, but, another person has... Them... Yeah, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. If you want to finish your, this uh, I was just going to say, giving, it's, it, that's a good example of, of what I'm talking about, though. Give them some context in the annotation. Mm -hmm. Here is how I think you should use this. Here is how I... Your, a research expert think you should use this specific link and then some advice based on the fact that they'll probably get too many results back. Right, yeah, of course. Um, someone else comments, um, I agree about creating guides for students, although some of it sounds a, like too much hand-holding for students. Why not talk about peer review, for example? Explain and I, that to uh, them. Yeah, absolutely. And when I say don't mention peer review, all I mean is make sure that you're using terms that they are going to recognize, terms that you know that your instructor, that you, the the course instructor has used with them. Mm. My point being, if if the instructor has given them an assignment that calls it uh, academic journal articles, and I say here is where to find peer review source peer reviewed sources, they may not have that mental connection. They're it's fine to use that the term. We all know. <laughs> But right, exactly. They may not know that. They may not know the terminology. Mm -hmm. So use terminology that that you know they're going to be familiar with from class. Is my point. Mm -hmm. And it's fine to absolutely fine to include some explanation, like you know these are also called peer-reviewed sources or whatever mm -hmm. I said. Uh, yeah. It's fine to to explicate that a little bit. But mm -hmm. point being, make sure that there are going to be some words on the page that they will recognize. Mm -hmm. and, and it's going to vary to from guide to guide depending on what yep. your instructors or the class or the resource or, or um, is, yeah. Absolutely true, and that, that speaks to the need for good communication with the instructor, and it speaks to the need for really having a good handle on the assignment and the information need and the specific context in order to make the best possible guide, I believe. Absolutely, yep. All right, go ahead. Sure. Um, let me talk very briefly about uh, writing on the web. Writing 
for writing effective text for the web is different from writing effective text for the printed page. You can see this quote here. This is from a user's study of uh, some research guides that a student had. Um, most librarians are not aware of uh, the fact that you need to write differently on the web in order for readers to take in the text effectively. Again, I've been harping on this point about minimal text. Um, let me see my notes for this. I'm not going to read you all of these bullet points because you can see that. Um, and some of these I've covered, but just be aware that web readers are going, by that I mean anybody using a, we, reading text on a web browser, they're going to be skimming for what they need. They're going to just visually skim through the page and look for terms that they recognize or useful information. Again, that, that gets back to that uh, jargon. Um, information seekers do not read a web page start to finish. Keep your text really short. Uh, you'll see recommendations to cut your text by 75% if you're writing it on the web. That's hard to do, but it's good to strive for. Um, make sure that you've got, uh, I'll show you what I mean by above the fold, but basically that just means high up on the page. The most important information should be high up on the page. You don't need to say click here when you're putting a link. If you see that blue text, you know that's a link, uh, blue underlined text. And a couple of a uh, couple of good style guides there that I recommend. There are lots of them out there. This is just a super simple example of what I mean by cutting your text down and making it skimmable. I've got click here uh, as my underlined blue link text. That underlined blue is a, it's a link, but B, it's also something that the eye is drawn to. And if all of your links on a page say click here, click here, click here, it's very hard for the eye to distinguish them. Uh, I've got some terms in here like access that don't really, doesn't really mean much. Uh, I've got the word database that might or might not mean something to a student. Um, what I did in the second line here is I just cut I cut the words by about 50%. Uh, I've added some terms, some active verbs like search, like find, uh, secondary sources. I'm assuming that students need to uh, students will recognize that term from class discussions. Um, and I've made America history and life. I've made that title into the link so that when they click on that it reinforces to them this is the name of the thing that I'm linking to. Very simple and this is again I could have maybe shown you a longer example that uh, that would be a little clearer but super simple to make some changes that, that make the, the text a little readable. I was talking about making your text, your, your pages vertically shorter. Um, this is a, an eye tracking study that was done. The most important information needs to be what we call above the fold on the page. And that just means the first screen of the page before you page down. I think this third uh, image here on the right is maybe the most, um, uh, the clearest example of that. Readers tend to skim across to the right and they tend to skim downward to look for what they need. This stuff down here at the bottom is barely getting looked at. The stuff, the navigational stuff over here on the left is barely getting looked at. The stuff that's in the top left corner and right from there and down from there is what's getting the most attention from readers. So be aware of that. It's better to have multiple short pages than it is to have one long page because this, the stuff at the bottom may not get seen. And this is all part of a web design principle called user experience, which basically just means make your pages attractive to look at, make them clean, make it easier for your user to understand what is on the page. So if, if they're spending less time looking, figuring out what goes where on the page and less time um, figuring out how to navigate, they have more mental energy, I call it mental bandwidth here, they have more attention basically, to pay to what you're looking at here. Um, I don't know what this image means. I found it when I was doing a search for images uh, and put in user experience, and I really liked the lion at the reference desk there. Well, darn, I was hoping you would explain that, that this is maybe some motto or something that I've never heard of before. No, I just really liked that. <laughs> I was like, well, I have to use this. I didn't even look at a second choice for that one. <laughs>
<laughs> really super simple example of uh, how I reworked one of my guides here, and uh, I am conscious of the time, so I'll, I'll go through this a bit quickly. But I got rid of the Start Here page. I got rid. This is the old version. I got rid of the Find Articles and Find Books page. There's a page here that you can't see because there's a drop-down menu about distinguishing scholarly from popular sources. And here, there's a for you to look at later if you really want to see it. Um, I got rid of some text. Uh, I had a lot of content that went past the fold as well. This is not a perfect guide, but here's an improved version. Uh, you can see here I've got tabs, background, selecting your topic basically, some background research, doing the literature review, and then they have to do a case study. So I've got sources for finding the lit, lit review on this second page. I've got um, some sources for the case study, and I've got what I consider the less important stuff, the APA style guide's there for reference, the Zotero guide is there for reference. There's less text, it's less blocky text, I've got more bullet points, there's a lot more that I could cut from here as well. Uh, there really is a lot but looking at it now that, that I could cut down here if I chose to. And what else did I do to it? I've got some bullet points on my next slide. Uh, I really tried to base this around the assignment as I've been talking about and made the text more concise. That's really uh, the, the most important thing. Librarians are not really visual designers. Um, again, the human eye takes in information on a web page differently than it does on a print page. And I've already talked about a few things that we can do to help uh, web readability. And these other things I've said already, really keep, uh, keep your pages simple. Keep them consistent from page to page so that people don't, again, simplicity makes the page more usable. And once somebody has figured out how to use a page on your guide, they should not have to refigure it out on every page. Some consistency across pages is very helpful. Visual design really makes a, a big difference for how users are, are taking in your guides and how they're likely, how it's likely to affect whether they use it again. Uh, this is a graph from a user study. I think it's the same one about um, how the guide made the student dizzy. I think this is the same study if I'm remembering correctly. But that blue bar, number one characteristic that students uh, praised on a guide, simple and clean layout made them more likely to go back and use the guide, they said, or why they would choose one over another. Second place is a tie for concise and clear annotations. And interestingly, search features, which I, I didn't really talk about in this presentation, but search features, students appreciate that, not having to go out to a, yet another link to find resources. Here's an example of one of my guides. Again, there is a lot wrong with this guide. It's too busy. But what I do uh, want to call your attention to is a couple of design elements here. One is the, the color scheme. I've got some red text here. The only place that I'm using color much at all is this red text. And it really pops out because the rest of it is such a simple color scheme. It's kind of a busy page, but the color scheme doesn't deviate much from black and white with some blue accents. And so that red text uh, pops out because the rest of it is so simple and so consistent. The farther away that you get from black and white, the more complicated the design gets and the harder it is for people to find what they need. But if you're doing just a very simple color scheme on your, your guide, just some simple emphasis, some bold or a simple color choice like that can make a big difference. The other thing is, I'm going to talk about uh, images a little bit and how that affects the guide. The Probably the first thing you notice and probably where your eye keeps going back to is this weird machine man. Um, one, because it's at that top left position that we saw from the eye tracking study, but it's also an area of high contrast on the page. It's also a really weird image that really draws the eye. So your eye tends to go there and hover there for a second or two. And what is probably happening, if, if a reader were actually looking at this guide, is their eye goes straight there, excuse me, and then it does that F shape to the right. So it's going to go straight to this text. And I think it's likely to go here to books, articles, newspapers, rather than looking at my welcome text up here at the top. Partly because that, that contrast, partly because he's got this weird horn thing on his head and he is actually looking there and that draws the attention. Secondary uh, point of focus might be that picture of me on the right. 
Here's another example of that. We call this a focal area or an entry point, and that's where your eye goes naturally. The eye does not naturally start on a text area on the screen. The eye naturally goes, I'm saying the eye, I'm talking about the attention of the reader. Uh, I do have an actual eye picture, a photo of the uh, an eye on here, and that's probably where your eye's going. If you want to see where the focal points on your page, where what if you want to see what places on your guide page are likely to attract the reader's attention first. Squint at the page so that the text blurs out and you'll probably see the text just turns into a gray blob. What does not totally blur out is these high contrast areas. That's usually images. Here's one, here's a secondary one. Again, top left is always going to be a focal point, an entry point on the page. And then maybe to this text, this bold text here on the right, probably the last page that the eye is going to go to this text. But if I've got fewer focal points on a page, remember that F shape. The eye is going to go to the, the reader's attention, that is, to clarify, the reader's attention is going to go to that focal point and then probably right and down from there. So uh, let's, uh, I'm getting close to the end here. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what you might call an institutional style guide, and a lot of libraries have these guidelines for guide authors. Um, the content of what you're putting in your guide matters a lot more, but what really can affect how your users use this content is whether your guides are consistent, readable, familiarity. If they look at one guide and can recognize another guide because the structure is similar, the design is similar, that helps a lot. And a consistent visual style does that. If you are creating guidelines for your guide authors, keep them simple and flexible because your guides need to meet a lot of different needs. Um, a history guide uh, does not have the same audience as a biology guide. A history class is not going to have the same types of information needs as a, an art and design class. Keep in mind that your librarians, your guide authors, need to have some flexibility. I've worked at a couple of libraries where we've tried to have templates for people. Uh, and you know there needs to be a page of find articles and there needs, a, needs to be a page of find books. That doesn't really work in the long run. Um, it's fine to have some content guidelines as far as visual style goes. Uh, we have had to, uh, from time to time, have had to rein in guide authors who were doing some very creative things with fonts and colors that were affecting the readability of the guide. But uh, really, this is the most important thing to keep in mind. This is a quote from a colleague of mine that, that really says it better than anything that I could come up with, I think. Um, Netta says that uh, once somebody has used one of your guides, they shouldn't have to think about it again. Um, they should recognize the visual structure. They should know what is going to be where in very general terms. But there's plenty of room for flexibility of content in there. So I'm going to wrap up with five minutes to go. I'm not going to linger on the recommended reading list here. This is just for your later uh, perusal if you're interested in, uh, these are some of my favorite sources that I've, I've come across in the course of doing this research. Um, and I will, Krista, I will send you the slides afterwards. Yes. We've got just a couple couple of minutes left. I do want to mention my book, as I said I would. It's called Modern Pathfinders, Creating Better Research Guides. Uh, it's from ACRL. You can get it from the ALA store or, of course, uh, Amazon or any of your better book retailers. But uh, uh, if you're interested in the ebook edition, I recommend getting it from the ALA store because they'll have a, uh, an edition without any DRM on it. You can use it on any device. Thank you very oh, much. Nice. And uh, happy to take a few minutes of questions if people can mm -hmm. hang around a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. It's about um, five of five to eleven um, here Central Time, so um, we do have time left in our official hour. But if we do go long, we will just stay on until everybody's questions are answered. Um, if you do need to take to leave because you only allotted an hour for this, um, not a problem. We're recording. You can always come back later and watch recording and catch all the questions we had. Um, we do have some questions. Uh, actually, uh, a couple of, a couple of questions about accessibility issues, which okay. I don't think you you didn't. I don't believe you mentioned. Um, I didn't. 
Yeah, someone oh, yeah. says uh, <laughs> that um, using the generic term click here, um, another reason why it's not a good thing to do, um, mm -hmm. is also confusing for an individual using a screen reader. Click here doesn't oh. identify what the link goes to, so it doesn't. it's not very helpful to people who are using those kind of assistive devices. I do not claim to be an accessibility expert of any kind, and I, that is actually new information to me. And I wish I'd known that actually when I was writing my my book, I would have mentioned that. That is, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a great point. Um, my expertise, as far as other things like screen readers and so on, I do know. Uh, my my experience, as I said, is is with LibGuides, and I know LibGuides um, is is pretty well known for responsive design and, um, and being pretty well ADA accessible. That is my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else with more expertise in accessibility issues may have more comment on that. Uh, it, I know it is important. I know it is something that I've, um, I have not looked at library school really since uh, a, a web design class that I took in library school. And there's a lot, <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot in, in technical terms, there's a lot that you can do to make guides um, uh, disability accessible. Mm -hmm. But I, I certainly don't claim any um, any particular expertise in that. So I don't know, I don't know what else I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that could, also then this other question might not be something you have anything that you could uh, speak to. Uh, someone wants to know if red, the color red should be avoided um, because of the prevalence of color blindness. Is that something to look into? I have heard, or, yeah, I have, I have read that also, that red and blue can cause problems with uh, colorblind readers. I don't actually use a lot of red emphasis text. I tend to use bold as opposed to a color to emphasize text on a page. Mm -hmm. um, I think in general though it's it's a good idea to be um, very conservative with your use of colored fonts. Um, I, what I can say about that, I can't speak to the the colorblindness specifically any more than any more than that, but I will say that the f uh, again, I, I mentioned this briefly, the farther you get away from a color scheme of black text on a white page, the farther you depart from that, the less readable in general your guide is going to be. Um, I, 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 like I said, I do workshops where I'm working with people over the course of a few weeks on designing guides. And uh, when I see people designing funky color schemes, there's nothing wrong with putting some color into your guides. You know, if you want to do sort of a pale yellow background or pale blue background, uh, you know, something that fits in with the rest of your, your website, that's just fine. Typically, black text is the way to go because the farther away from that you get, the more you risk it looking really weird on the page and, and I think color blindness can be an issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of times that kind of thing is not going, it's going to vary from monitor to monitor and computer to computer. People looking at your page and, and browser to browser, people looking at your page are not necessarily going to see that same color shade the same way you do. And right. maybe and looking something, again, that, making something that looks just perfect, and then someone else on their own computer somewhere looks at it and goes, "Oh my gosh, why did they do that? That's that's just hideous." <laughs> well, and that that speaks to a more general point of try your try your guides out in a variety of resolution monitors, mm -hmm. different shape monitors, and some different devices if you've got yeah. access to a tablet. And of course, we've all got smartphones. Look at your guide on a smartphone and see yeah. how it, see how it looks. I don't think a lot of our users. Are, are using them on uh, on mobile devices, but it's worth checking because I, I know that some of them are. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Smartphones, I think, are, are harder because the screen size, but tablets now, I know I use my tablet yeah. for doing a lot of reading of websites and things now. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just, and, and even and just some just, different monitor resolutions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, another question. Oh, wait. Yes, there was another one. I'm sorry, I got confused with my list here. Um, okay. Can you recommend any free resources for creating guides? Oh boy, um, by that do you mean like a free content management system or free like guides to creating guides? I don't know if you mean like a free platform to create guides on or 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 instructional things. Or instruction kind of instructional material, yeah. Yeah, can can you clarify? Do you, what do you want? Do you want a free place to actually do guides in, or do you just want some? 
as far as far as a free sort of platform, I've seen libraries that use uh, open source. There there are a couple of open source content management systems if you've got the support to mm. install them. Um, I mean, I've seen guides for that matter. I've seen guides built on um, uh, Google Sites. I've seen guides built on uh, Wiki software. Uh, you know, whatever. Frankly, you don't have to purchase a separate content management yeah. system. But I don't okay. Know um, she says I've heard, I've used Live Binders, but would like to hear of other. I'm not familiar with that. Um, I, those are a couple of other ones that I have seen used. Um, and, you know, really whatever content <clears throat> management system. A lot of librarians, it seems like since the rise of LibGuides, a lot of librarians seem to feel like we need a separate content management system to build our guides in, and that's not necessarily the case. A guide can simply be a web page on your existing library website. The downside is often that they're harder to use and you don't want to have, you know, you don't want your instructional librarians to, to have to learn, you know, a difficult content management system just to build guides. And I think that's why LibGuides is so popular because it is easy to use and you need minimal technical knowledge. But as I said, any, basically any platform that you can build a web page on. LibGuides has some features that are specifically designed with libraries in mind, but you can apply these principles just you know, with Notepad and an HTML editor. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are other CMSs that people want to mention or other other guide systems that you're using, um, I'm drawing a blank on um, uh, one of. There's an open source one, Ooh, and I'm I'm completely drawing a blank on the name of it after talking for an hour. But there there are open source systems that that you know are like LibGuides but free. But you would need to to install it on your own server. WordPress, I think, would work perfectly well as a content management system for guides. Mm -hmm. But really, um, whatever your library is using, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I did oh, look up that one. that um that with Live Binders. It's a uh, um it's a it's organize your resources and like an online binder for content creation. It describes itself as um, your digital organize your resources in online digital binder. So similar to, yeah, like a uh, guides, I think, but okay. online have got business education, sex specific session sections. So I'll include a that link to it like if a, people are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I will actually take a look at that. That's new to me, but it sounds like it might lend itself well to, uh, uh as a guides platform. Um, I will take a look at that. Yeah. Similar. All right. Um, are there other questions? Um, I know, doesn't let anybody have any last minute, we're a little past 11 o'clock, so if anybody has any last minute urgent questions they want to ask of Jason before we go, get them typed in right away. Um, we just have a few of them, you know, thanks. And someone says, I'm impressed with this program. I'm getting so many good ideas for the things I do. Oh, thank <laughs> I you so much. Actually, earlier, even when you were talking about just the regular design and UX issues in general, not even just specific to doing, you know, um, your gui your research guides. There's more in the book, I'm just saying. <laughs> yes. And bibliography's in the book, so. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it doesn't look like anything's coming in, so I think okay. we wrapped up. Yeah, if you do need more information, like I said, this is being recorded. It'll be posted. Um, you'll have this. We'll have the slides, and um, that has that. The, there were those um, resources on there, and I will go through those and um, link to any of them as I can as well. Um, we keep all our links together in our delicious account here at the Library Commission, so I will grab anything that was linked to or mentioned. That's real website type um, will be included later on as well. Thank you so much, Krista, for the invitation. Thank you, Nebraska Thank Library you. Commission. Thank you all for coming, and uh, I'm really pleased that we had such a great turnout and terrific mm -hmm. questions. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Jason. All right. I'm going to pull back control to my screen here now. Wait for it to show up. There we go. All right. So, yes, that will wrap it up for this week's edition of Encompass Live. As I said, we recorded, and this is our Encompass Live homepage. You can actually just Google Encompass Live, and you'll find it. Uh, apparently, we're the only thing being called that so far. Yay. <laughs> Um, but right here beneath our upcoming shows is a link to our archives. Um, this is where we have actually all of our archives going back to the very beginning of the show, which was January 2009. So if you want to watch some old things, go on here and check them out. Um, this was last week's, just like this one from last week. We will have a link to the recording on our YouTube account, um, a link to um, Jason's slides. You're going to send them to me then, right? And I'll put them up in yes, our slide share. Yes, remind me okay. this afternoon. I'll be happy to, of Oops, course. We'll put them up there. And then all any links I collected, which I can, you can see I've started over here, um, and delete just redesigned itself since I did this last week. Whoa. Um, 
grabbing any of the links that are related um, to today's show will all be included there. Most likely by later this afternoon that will be available. Um, just takes depends on how long it takes for things to process through YouTube. Um, when that is available, I will send an email to everyone to let you guys know that it's ready to watch and share. Um, other than that, I hope you join us next week when our topic is summer reading. Summer reading programs coming up for all you public libraries. Uh, Sally Snyder, who is our coordinator of children's and young, um, young adult library services here at the commission, is going to do her annual look at um, book talks about titles to use for this year's program. Um, themes, which are um, uh, sports gaming related. On your mark, get set, read for children, and get in the game, read for teens. So uh, definitely sign up for that and any of our other upcoming shows we have here. We've got our March and the start of our April sessions listed. We'll be adding more as they all get finalized, so keep checking back. Also, if you are on Facebook, big Facebook user, we do have a Facebook page. I do post here reminders of when a show is starting. Here's one for this morning when I posted this morning saying, hey, log in, and when our recording is available. I also post it on here as well. So if you are a big um, user of Facebook, do pop over there and like our Encompass Live page. Other than that, that wraps it up for today. Thank you very much, and we will see you next week on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.